I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room issues. Was you don't ever say to her that her point about the shock was... She's qualified for services. We left. More of a community. We're trying to back over. doing an autism. The UN is an imperfect but indispensable institution, and our challenge is to use it well and wisely. Those are the words of Gillian Sorensen, and she would know she's dedicated nearly 30 years of her life to the organization and remains its tireless advocate. She's held a number of positions during her extensive UN career, including Assistant Secretary General for External Affairs under Kofi Annan and Special Advisor for Public Policy under Boutrous Boutrous Ghali. She currently works as a senior advisor to the UN Foundation. We'll find out why she says a strong UN makes the U.S. safer, as well as why she she thinks it's important for us to be active participants in the organization we created. Here's our conversation with Gillian Sorensen. Gillian Sorensen, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Good to be here. I think most of us uh, know at least a little about the United Nations. It was started after World War II in 1945. Originally, there were 53 uh, member countries. Give us a brief history of the UN and its purpose for being. Well, the UN was born out of the ashes of war. Even in the middle of the war in 1942, Franklin Roosevelt was thinking about how we could do better, how we could do differently, what new organization could be created that would learn lessons from the past and, and be there to help us create a more peaceful world. So that conversation began very early. And the charter conference that, that designed and launched the UN took place in the fall, in the end of summer and early fall of 1945. Uh, and as you say, 53 member states came together to design a new UN. Its purpose was to join forces to share the burden, the risk, the cost, the responsibility, and the benefits of cooperative action. Um, and to come up with a way of working, not just on issues related to peace and security, but also to health, on health and human rights, uh, and other aspects of life that would create a better world. It was idealistic. Uh, and visionary in its way, but it was also grounded in reality, in real politics. Uh, and that's the genius of that original plan. Today, those 53 countries number 193, and it is universal. All the earth is represented, and that's what makes it truly unique. And for its first uh almost 40 years, it was a completely bipartisan organization. What has happened in the last, mostly in the last decade, uh, that has made it such a controversial uh, mm -hmm. organization? That is to say, though, in those first three decades, it did have bipartisan support in this country. Um, but then um, some began to uh, to, to say, to describe it as an organization that was a threat to us or that required us to compromise. Well, yes, compromise and cooperation is part of joining with others to move us all forward uh, in a good direction. Um, I, I think they totally misunderstood and, uh, and, and almost demonized the UN in a way that was quite destructive. In the beginning, that came from the far edge. Uh, but it began to move into the more common discourse, even from some members of Congress or... In, Sixty members of Congress are what you might call anti-UN. I know, and that's very short-sighted. Look, whether we wish it or not, we're connected to the rest of the world. To miss the opportunity for global cooperation uh, is to cut ourselves short and isolate us. That doesn't serve our interests. Working with the UN, being an active, visible, and constructive member of the UN is in our national interest, our personal interest, our safety, our security, our health, our prosperity, our ability to travel and trade, uh, and indeed, our ability to lead in the world. Madeleine Albright, a former uh, ambassador to the UN, uh, said that uh, even superpowers need friends. Absolutely. We need friends. We need partners. We need the ability to build a coalition. And even if we wanted to do all the things that need doing, we couldn't do it alone, and we shouldn't. This is a way um, to cooperate and to say to the rest of the world, we're in this together. 
The truth is we are a, 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 a strong power. We know that. But to share this effort, uh, is the best possible way to build friendships and partnerships around the world. One of the most important things the, the UN is working on is the Millennium Development Goals, yes. which were established in 2000. A lot of the targets for those Millennium Goals, and there are eight of them, beginning with cutting uh, poverty in half, many of the targets were 2015. What's the status? How are we doing in terms of reaching those goals? Yes, I'm glad you bring that up because it's so important. For the first time, the Millennium Development Goals, obviously launched in the year 2000, defined what poverty is, what are the elements of this, and gave us, uh, uh, us I mean the world, a, a point of reference, a common language to use when we talk about how do we reduce poverty which is the condition of over a billion people on earth. That means extreme poverty, dire poverty. A dollar a day. Yeah. And, and it talks about safe birth, beginning at the beginning, so to speak, clean water, uh, basic health care, primary education, at least up to sixth, grades, uh, sixth grade, um, the empowerment of women, and so forth down the line. The last goal is to bring the, the developed or wealthier countries into it in terms of what they contribute, how they share their progress, how we literally join in reducing poverty on this earth. You're right, the target year is 2015. Now, will we have reached the goals? Clearly not. They are aspirational. They are the ideal and the goal out there. But um, they have had it at several points along the way, an assessment, analysis of how far we've come, of success stories, of how to duplicate that success here in another place there. It's been very, very useful. Now, 2015 is just Around in front the corner. of us. And then they will do a, a total summary of what progress has been made. And they will redefine it in some ways for the next well, we don't know, maybe the next 15 years, up to 2030. Um, the reduction of poverty is, a, is an ongoing uh, effort and process, but it's something we all need to join in. Reaching these goals is a priority for uh, member countries, and, and you mentioned 193. It's interesting, if you look at the United States, the United States ranks 34th in infant mortality. Yeah, yeah. And we should so, do better. We, we, we can do better. Uh, and certainly we have issues at home. I don't minimize that. But at least here we have a functioning government. We do have a safety net. We have homeless shelters. We have uh, uh, good hospitals. Um, we, we have YWCAs and others that, that help and work with communities and, of course, many, many civic groups who do that. In other parts of the world, there is no safety net. There is no Medicare, no Social Security, none of that. So when people fall to the bottom level, they are really locked into a poverty trap. We often say there cannot really be peace without development, and there can't be peace and development with about, without human rights. So those three all connect, and it's an enormous challenge at home and even more overseas. So we need to lead and serve as a model if we can. You say we need to lead and serve as a model, and yet many of the treaties, many of them based on, uh, on human rights, the, uh, the human rights of children, for example, uh, many that have been drafted in part by the United States have not been signed or ratified by yes. the United States. You're right. There are uh, uh, more than 10 major treaties that have been drafted with the participation of American experts. They are in force. The su sufficient number of countries have signed on, but the U.S. does not sign. Now, why? To sign, uh, to ratify here, we need the signature of the president and two-thirds vote in the Senate. And uh, the reality is that a, a group of the hard right uh, members of Congress, have some of them have simply said they will never sign an international treaty. Others have picked apart the various treaties, including the Convention on the Rights of Children, the Convention to Eliminate Discrimination Against Women, the Law of the Sea, and other treaties related to the reduction of arms and so on. Um, they, they, <laughs> 
they look at those as if it's a threat or in some way diminishes us. Makes us look weak and is a threat to yeah. our sovereignty. To is the contrary. It's an expression of sovereignty. It's an expression of leadership. It joins us with others who share this cause and concern. To not sign leaves us on the outside looking in. I would urge that members of, of Congress see these treaties as a step forward. And, and that we sign those and then work from within to improve or move them ahead in a way that benefits all of us. President Obama restored the ambassador to the UN as a, as a cabinet position. Yeah. Susan Rice, of course, yes. is, is our, our current ambassador. Uh, and more recently, John Bolton, who's a former ambassador, said that, that to make it a, a cabinet position overstates uh, the importance of the UN and U.S. foreign policy. I disagree with him there. I think it is important to have it a cabinet position. It gives us, it gives it stature and recognition uh, that it that matters. Um, but uh, to, uh, John Bolton <laughs> always dismisses the UN. I would say the United Nations is one among a number of very important international organizations. We need to use it wisely and well. We need to be visible and active and constructive in the UN. And once again, it serves us well, as, as, as uh, in addition to being a, a, a place for leadership, where the US can stand tall, can, can serve as a, a, a model, we hope, uh, can build these partnerships that, that are so important in the world. Um, when we think of the whole range of UN work from peacekeeping, development, disarmament, human rights, refugee assistance, global health, environmental protection, those all are global issues that require global responses that cross borders. But they do touch us at home, and we need to be there. You had a lot of uh, uh, faith in the Obama administration. In fact, I think you referred to, uh, to his administration uh, as a new age of engagement. Have you, has he lived up to your hopes? That was actually his phrase. In his first speech to the United Nations, he spoke of the new era of engagement. And he sent Susan Rice, one of his best and most respected colleagues, to lead our, the US mission to the UN. He has returned many times. He's reinstated our, our contribution and involvement with the UN uh, uh, pop, uh, population or family planning fund. He has reinstated our full commitment to peacekeeping. We don't send soldiers, as we know, but as you know, but we do send transport and communications and logistical support. That's very important. He has made many efforts to see that the UN and he personally uh, is uh, committed and and visibly. Uh, present. How was the failure to close Guantanamo Bay seen by other members of the UN? There's some criticism about that. Um, it is in many respects a domestic issue. Uh, I hope that will happen. I believe it will in, in due course, but it's something not resolved at the moment. Perhaps in, if, if Obama is reelected, um, that would be resolved in the second term. You're here at Penn State to give a talk, mm -hmm. uh, the title of which is Empowering Women <clears throat> in a Changing World. Why is empowering women such a critical mission of the United Nations? Well, women, after all, are half the human race. And we know that countries that exclude or prohibit women from, from achieving potential uh, are never going to thrive and prosper. Uh, it is right at the heart of the UN's commitment to see that women in different cultures and in different backgrounds have a chance, first of all, to be healthy. A healthy woman means also a healthy mother and a, a, a woman who can thrive and care for her family and contribute or work or, 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 or raise a, may earn a, a living, and, and, and that matters a lot. Um, but, but women also contribute in community and public life. So it's not just a human rights issue, it's also an economical issue. Absolutely. It affects the entire community. And uh, to give women safe birth, access to family planning, 
education, literacy, numeracy, opportunity to work and contribute, and a chance to have a voice, to speak up, to have an opinion, to vote, to be present and, and visible. That's very important. Uh I'm going to talk a little bit about something that Stephen uh, Lewis, who was the former mm -hmm. U.S. envoy uh, uh, for AIDS, uh, HIV AIDS, he said the struggle for gender equality is the single most important struggle there is on the face of the earth. Uh, on one hand, that, that sounds like he's, he's overstating that. On the other, if you look at women, uh, they're disproportionately affected in terms of poverty, in terms of uh, contracting HIV AIDS. Uh, what's your response to that? I might not have said it quite that way, but it is extremely important. Um, and, and the UN um, has now made this uh, a very central effort uh, that will continue long into the future. Uh, the world conferences on women have been just extraordinary. And we've discovered that we may live 10,000 miles apart, but we as women have, have very common concerns. And we're able to help each other, to inspire and encourage and assist and support each other. But this is not just a woman's issue for women. This is a woman's issue that affects men, children, boys and girls, uh, all around the world. I do want to mention uh, the, the aspect of adolescent girls. There's a, an age period from about 10 to 14 that's very vulnerable in terms of what happens in their life to come. And, and there have been extraordinary efforts through the UN Foundation and the UN Association to strengthen, to give confidence and courage and, and, and support for adolescent girls as they move into the next uh, chapter of their lives. So yes, it does uh, matter a lot to families. Um, the issue of violence against women uh, is very key, um, and we hope that we can, uh, can, can make this uh, a commitment both from the top, from leaders around the world, but also from the grassroots and community groups of all kinds uh, to see how important this is. The risk of, of rape and domestic violence uh, worldwide is greater than cancer, motor vehicle accidents, war and malaria combined. That to me is yeah. absolutely mind-boggling. It is shocking. There is, of course, domestic violence. We know what that means. But there's another kind of violence that seems more prevalent now, and that's violence in war, which uses rape as a weapon. And that destroys not only the woman and the family, but the, the community. It splits the family. It's absolutely devastating. And that's got to stop. Rape is a crime. And too often, the rapists have complete immunity. They don't see it as a crime. They're never prosecuted. That's got to stop. And the training of lawyers and the, the building of systems of justice around the world who understand that uh, is important. Women's safety uh, and their ability to, to step out, to be part of the community, to feel safe and respected uh, is extremely important. Beyond urging countries to take these issues up as, as priorities. What, what muscle does the UN really have, uh, in other words, to make these Millennium Development Goals a reality? We can't force the issue, but the UN is the global forum. Everybody comes there. And we have some powerful and compelling speakers backed up with the most persuasive statistics that you can find about why this is important if a society is to thrive. We can hold up these examples. We can exert some peer influence or, or pressure, if you want to call it that. We can uh, give uh, life stories. That is, if I say 20 million refugees, that may be a number. But if you can tell a story about this family or that young girl or boy, that makes it live and breathe and, and come alive in a different way. We, we have a chance to persuade and inspire leaders to move in this direction and to do it collectively, together, to share what works uh, and to, to encourage us all to this end. One of the biggest criticisms of the UN is that it's overstaffed, it's overpaid. There, oh. there, there's one statistic that, that says that $3 billion in aid means $1 billion on the ground. Two-thirds of it is siphoned off uh, by people who are, are 
taking money uh, that was really directed for humanitarian or, or other needs. How do we address that? First of all, it is certainly not overstaffed. When you consider what the United Nations is doing, all the things that I mentioned before, and that it is a global enterprise, it's not local, um, the numbers doing this are actually very few. McDonald's has far more people around the world, more staff than does the United Nations. We only can do what we do with the partnerships of non-governmental organizations, which are extraordinary, who join with us as our working partners. Now, is it overpaid? I don't think so. And we now have inspectors general on every aspect of the UN budget. Transparency and accountability are the byword. There may have been some misuse in the past. I think that's not happening now. We, we work on what I would call uh, a shoestring budget to do all that we do. And, and we try our very best to see that every dollar uh, is carefully used. To me, the U.S. contribution to the United Nations is a dollar well spent. And the return on that contribution comes back to us many times over. Uh, and yet the United States is in arrears on its dues to the United Nations. Uh, well, the end of the year hasn't come yet, and, and I think and, and trust that we will pay our dues in full by the end of December. What, what impact does the, the discord between the U.S. and the U.N. have on the U.N.'s ability to function properly? Well, remember, the U.S. is a very important member of the United Nations, but we are one of 193. The UN moves apace, moves forward as best it can under any circumstance. But we know from experience that when the United States is fully committed and present and involved, the chances of success are always better. That's why, given the country that this is, it matters a lot for us to be there, not to dismiss it, not to use it as an organization of convenience when it suits us, but to make clear to the world that we are fully committed and to build upon the UN successes, even as we work in a quieter way to address its, its shortcomings. When I think of the UN's successes, one that comes to mind is the eradication of smallpox yes. worldwide. What do you, because you've actually seen face to face how the UN has affected lives, what do you see as the UN's proudest moments? Let me add to the eradication of smallpox, which was extraordinary. That was a global scourge. Very soon, within the next few years, we will see the eradication of polio on the face of the earth. Many people don't remember, but polio was, uh, was terrifying in this country, too. We know where the last cases are. We're cornering those. It, there will be a day where we will celebrate the end of that. I think that's... And I think we've gone one year. It has to be three years before we can declare that, that we have eradicated right, smallpox. Right, right. It still exists in three countries, but we're nearing the end of it. Um, in other areas, you can't say it's done, but we're moving in the right direction uh, uh, in, in our work, especially, I think, in, in health. Um, in many ways, and safer birth, and prenatal care, and, and, and healthy children. Um, but it's an enormous challenge, and we simply have to take the long view and uh, to, to know that what we do is literally life-changing and life-saving. There are, right now, more women world leaders than there have ever been mm -hmm. uh, ever, uh, yeah. 20 simultaneously. Yes. What difference does that make? Do women see things differently? Do they have different priorities? Are you seeing a difference because of that? I've met a number of those leaders, not just um, presidents or prime ministers, but members of their cabinets, women of very high, high standing in their own governments. And it's, a, it's an, an amazing group. Many backgrounds, different training, some coming through politics, some coming through other academic or, or other experience. Um, but they have a measure of confidence uh, and drive uh, that is exceptional. Now, do they lead in a different way with men? It's not to say that they're not tough. No one would ever say Indira Gandhi was not a very strong woman or, or, or other women leaders. Um, they are. But they have other considerations that I think reflect a sensitivity to uh, families and community life and to more of a consensus decision making 
than a command decision uh, role. Uh, it does differ somewhat from the male leaders. When Madeleine Albright became ambassador, her first uh, social uh, function was to invite the women ambassadors at the UN, who numbered about 15 at that time, and a few of us who were senior in the United Nations Secretariat to come to lunch. And the conversation was really uh, marvelous, and that conversation continues. Speaking uh, of Madeleine Albright and the conversation continuing, she said what we need is militant moderation, that those who support the United Nation, that they need to be more forceful and more assertive in defending its, its purpose. I do like that phrase, militant moderation. We know that extremists on the right or the left will, will, will raise the flag and, 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 and shout and make all kinds of <laughs> uproar. What we need are people in that moderate center, moderate right or left, whatever, who are willing to engage and discuss and in some ways compromise to move everyone forward. We need that everywhere. We need it in the U.S. Congress. We need it in, in global politics as well. I think the, the moderate center, assertive moderate center, has the best chance of, of joined efforts in the most constructive way that can make, help us make a better world. Gillian Sorensen, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Gillian Sorensen. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also be able to learn more about UN initiatives. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.